sparking, snapping, and crackling. Bright red flames roared upward, dirty black oily smoke coiling and twisting into the night air over the car yard. John D. threw back his head and breathed deeply. All he could smell was the stink of burning rubber and oil. He could detect no magic on the air. I'm going inside, he said to Bastet. I would not advise that, the cat hided goddess warned. Why ever not? The Dark Elder showed her teeth in what might have passed for a terrifying smile. She pulled her long black coat tighter around her narrow shoulders. It would be a shame if one of the Wild Hunt mistook you for an enemy, or the Archon decided to make you one of his pack. He lost wolves this night. He will need to replace them. I am not completely defenseless, madam, Dee said. From beneath his coat, he pulled the short stone sword Excalibur and strode across the empty street toward the car yard. He stopped at the thick gates. The heavy metal was studded with punctures from the teeth on the Archon's club, and where the metal had split, it had been pulled apart and curled like aluminum foil. Dee brought the sword close to where the Archon would have touched the metal, but nothing happened. If Sir Nunus had used any magical power, Excalibur would have reacted, but the blade remained cold and dark. Dee nodded. The creature had used brute strength to tear open the gates. He was beginning to wonder just how much auric or magical power Sarnunus possessed. Legend spoke of the Archons, and even the earliest elders, the Great Elders, who had come after them, as being either giants or hideous monsters, and sometimes both. But they were never described as magicians or sorcerers. It was the Great Elders who had first developed these abilities. D bit back a smile. Now that he suspected that Sir Nunus possessed little or no magical power, he was starting to feel more confident. The creature had suggested that it could read his mind, but it could have been lying. He tried to recall exactly what the Archon had said when it had first appeared. Your thoughts and memories are mine to read, magician. I know what you know. I know what you have been. I know what you are now. Well, that meant nothing. Sir Nunus claimed he knew Dee's thoughts, but had not proved it in any way. Dee knew that his elder had briefed the Archon. The Alchemist, Flamel, and the children are with the Saracen Knight and the Bard behind their makeshift metal fortress. You want me and the Wild Hunt to force an entrance for you. Sarnunus had not revealed anything new either. It was merely repeating a fact. A fact D already knew, and then stating the orders it had received from the elders. It had only made it sound as if he were reading D's thoughts. Dr. John D laughed softly. The creature was certainly ancient, powerful, and undoubtedly deadly. But suddenly, it didn't seem quite so frightening. Gripping the sword tightly, he slipped through the entrance into the narrow metal alleyway. He could hear the fire. It was closer now, crackling and moaning, painting the walls in dancing, darting shadows. Dee realized that, with every step, he sent up billowing clouds of gritty dust. Squeezing his lips tightly shut, he pulled a white handkerchief from his pocket and pressed it to his mouth. He didn't want to breathe in the gritty remains of the wild hunt. He had been a magician, a sorcerer, a necromancer, and an alchemist for too long, and could easily imagine what foul properties the dust contained. He certainly didn't want them in his lungs. He walked over storm-tipped wooden arrows and leaf-bladed spears, and discovered that the ground was littered with short crossbow bolts. The sight took him back to his youth. He had attended sieges, had studied warfare at the court of Elizabeth, and could tell from the broken remains what had taken place. The defenders had trapped most of the wild hunt in the narrow alleyway and reduced them to dust. But why had they not held this position and continued to fire down it into the attackers? Because they had run out of ammunition, he thought, answering his own question, and had been forced to withdraw to a more defensible position. Beneath the white handkerchief, Dee's lips broke into a broad smile. History had taught him that once the defenders started to retreat, the siege was coming to an end. Flamel and the others were trapped. 
emerging from the metal alleyway, he spotted the flaming moat. It completely encircled a mean-looking metal hut at the center of the camp. D hurried forward. He knew a dozen spells that would put out the fire. Or he could transmute the oil into sand and use a separate Persian spell that would turn the sand to glass. The alchemist and the twins stood on the opposite side of the fire, the boy and girl close together. Firelight turned their blonde hair red and gold. Two other human knights stood alongside them, one tall and bulky in black armor, the other short and slight in mismatched armor. Red-haired Gabriel Hounds, in both human and dog shapes, gathered protectively around the shorter man. The Archon stood outlined before the dancing flames, firelight playing on its rack of antlers, while behind it what remained of the wild hunt waited patiently. The wolves' human faces tracked Dee's movements as he picked his way across the pothole expanse of mud. Without moving its body, Cernunus twisted its head around to regard the magician. The horned god's eyes fixed on the stone blade in his hand, which now had started to leak a cold blue smoke. Excalibur and Clorent together in the same place. Cernunus' buzzing voice murmured in Dee's skull. These are indeed momentous times. Do you know when last these two swords were united? D was about to tell him that both swords had been in Paris the previous day, but decided not to say anything to irritate the creature. A terrifyingly nasty plan was beginning to form at the back of his mind, something in so incomprehensible that he was almost afraid to focus on the idea, just in case Sir Nunes really could read his thoughts. Taking up a position to the left of the creature, he held Excalibur in his right hand and folded his arms across his chest. The glowing blue blades painted the left-handed side of his face in chill color. I believe it was here, in England, Dee said, when Arthur fought his nephew Mordred on Salisbury Plain. Mordred used Clarent to kill Arthur. I killed Arthur, Sir Nunu said softly. Mordred too, and he was Arthur's son, not his nephew. The horn god's head turned back to the fire. You are a magician. I presume you can douse these flames. Of course! A new smell permeated the already foul air. The rotten egg stink of brimstone. Can you not cross through the fire? He asked, deliberately testing the limits of the Horned God's powers. The flames are laced with metal, Sir Nunu said shortly. Dee nodded. He knew from experience that some metals, especially iron, were poisonous to elders. And to Archons too, he had just discovered. He wondered if the two races were related in any way. He always assumed that, well, they were similar, they were separate, like elders and human eye. I can kill the fire, Dee answered confidently. The Archon leaned forward, its ripe forest odor suddenly strong as it stared hard into the fire and beyond. Dee followed the direction of its gaze and found it was staring at the boy, Josh. You can have the twins, magician, and your pages. I claim the three immortal humani and the Gabriel hounds for my own. Agreed, Dee said immediately. And Clorent, I claim the Sword of Fire. Of course you can have it, Dee said without hesitation. He deliberately allowed his aura to blossom yellow and stinking around him, knowing it would blanket his thoughts. He had no intention of giving Sir Nunus the sword. Dee had spent centuries searching for Excalibur's twin blade and was not prepared to see it disappear into some distant shadow realm with the Horn God. His outrageous plan suddenly came together. I would be honored to present the sword to you myself. I would allow that, the Archon said, a touch of arrogance in its voice. Dee bowed his head so that the creature would not see the triumph in his eyes. He would stand before the Archon, Excalibur in his right hand, Clarent in his left. He would bow to the horned god and step forward and then plunged both swords into Sir Nunus. The magician's brimstone aura flared brighter and brighter with excitement. What would it feel like? What would he learn? What would he know? 
after he had killed the Archon. 